Okay, I think we're all good to go. AV team up top, happy days, lovely. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon to the uh, national final 2022 of the Early Career Awards. We're very grateful. This is a hybrid event, so obviously yourselves in the audience, thank you for coming. But also we've got a number of people clocking onto the Zoom call as well. So just to briefly introduce first the, uh, the Early Career Network. So we are in charge of hosting this event. We are a, a subgroup of the Geological Society itself. And we were established in 2018, primarily to, to uh, look after the best interests of the early career geologists within the, the society. And those are sort of defined as anyone within the first 10 or so years of their geoscientific careers. Now we are uh, across various social media platforms. If you'd like to stay in touch, please feel free to, to follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, or Facebook. We do have a website as well, at least on the Geological Society web pages. Um, so you can have a look at some of our previous events, what we're up to, what we're going to be doing as well in the future. And if you'd like to stay in touch further, we do have uh, a mailing list, which you can also sign up to. So the Early Career Award itself is an, an annual competition, has been running for a number of years now, and the Early Career Network recently took over uh, for the last couple of years. Um, there are seven finalists here with us today. We've got, I think, uh, three in the audience and four going to be presenting online. And each one of these uh, finalists has uh, completed and or competed and completed uh, the regional uh, heats that are operated by the regional groups, including one all the way from Hong Kong. So it's fantastic to see such a large engagement uh, compared to what we've seen in previous years. So uh, we'll finish uh, the introductions very shortly and then we'll crack on with the finest presentations themselves. Again, we've got seven uh, finalists. Each one will have 10 minutes to, uh, to speak, to present on a topic or a project that they are particularly interested in, followed by five minutes approximately of Q&A from the judges directly. And once we've had all of the presentations, uh, the, uh, the judges will go into a separate room to deliberate. And what we will do here in the you know, 10, 15 minute interlude is we will have the Early Career Network AGM, just to show you what we've been doing recently, some committee changes, and also again, what we're gonna plan over the course of the next 12 months or so. Following that, we'll have the award ceremony for the winner. And uh, at the conclusion of the event, we also have a, a drinks reception uh, just in the uh, library adjacent. So, cracking on uh, with the judges themselves. So we have three fantastic judges today with us, um, and we're very pleased to have, uh, have them. We've got two in the audience, and one of which is online. So the first judge is uh, Dr. Jenny Gilbert. Um, she is the Associate Director of the NERC and Vision Programme at the University of Lancaster. And uh, she holds a PhD in volcanology and geochemistry from the University of Cambridge, 
and her research primarily uh, has focused on the dispersal of volcanic ash in the environment, as well as interactions between volcanoes and ice. Uh, Ginny is also a senior fellow at the Higher Education Academy uh, and a professional membership scheme that uh, promotes excellence in higher education, and she also currently sits on the Council of the Geological Society itself. The second judge that we have with us uh, today is uh, Dr. David Giles. Um, he is a technical director of uh, Car Geotechnics Limited, or CGL, with over 35 years of experience in academia and the geotechnics industry, including 28 years of which have uh, been spent lecturing and researching in the field of engineering geology. So David is a, an active member of the Geological Society's engineering group, as well as holding uh, various positions uh, as member and past chair of the Geological Society working parties, including the UK uh, Geological Hazards, and the engineering, uh, geology, and geomorphology of glaciated and periglaciated terrains. And our final judge, who is uh, at the moment down in probably sunnier Cornwall at the moment, uh, calling in online, is Dr. Karen Hudson Edwards. Uh, she is a professor at the University of Exeter's Camborne School of Mines, focusing on environmental geochemistry and mineralogy as part of the Mining, uh, Environment, and Society Research Group. So, Karen holds a PhD from the University of Manchester following which he took on uh, research roles at Leeds, the Natural History Museum and lastly Burbeck before moving down to Cornwall campus uh, at the University of Exeter itself. So those are our judges. Thank you very much for, for uh, allocating your, your time this afternoon to this event. And then the last thing to do is introduce the, the finalists themselves. So we're all uh, looking to uh, potentially steal this uh, lovely trophy down at the front. So we've got seven finalists, again, from different regional groups, uh, including, again, from Hong Kong, which is the first time, I think, in the, the history of this award. Um, again, we've got four who are going to be calling in online, and we've got three in the audience. And again, we'll just go one by one, uh, 10 minute presentation, followed by five minutes of Q&A. So I think without any further ado, uh, we will try and get Francis Lee to present presentation number one. Maybe team can sort that out. So good af good afternoon. I would like to bring also the greetings from Hong Kong Regional Group to all of you in London. It will be my pleasure to share some of the excitement involving the projects of revitalization of the Mahan Lead Mine. Throughout the projects, it has been a great chance for us to explore the important chapter of Hong Kong's mining history and the rich industrial heritage left behind. For understanding and reconstructing this heritage, we have been building 3D model of the abandoned mine using handheld laser scanner. In these presentations, we will focus on how we understand the Lin Ma Han mine, started by some background of the site, followed by data collections and integrations into regional ground model. By reconstructing the mine extent, it helps us better understand and plan for the future development of the mine. The purpose of these projects aims to make safe the abandoned mine cave for low density visits by the public and showcase its heritage mining history while minimizing disturbance to existing structures and ecology. Our first task is to understand the mine extent. Lin Mahan is named after an orangey like fruit commonly found in the region in which local villagers call it Lin Ma. The mine is located at the border between Hong Kong and Shenzhen PRC. The mine is an abandoned mine site operated in the 19th century until 1962. It was developed by a series of edits at different levels with, an, with over 2,000 meters of tunnel excavated. The soil geology of the areas is predominantly coarse ash crystal tuff, subject to low-grade regional metamorphism. Major minerals in the mine include galena and pyrite, in which galena is the main minerals with economic values. During this intermediate operation of 40 years, an estimated 60,000 tons of lead 
and 360,000 ounces of silver were produced. The Mahan has been designated as a site special scientific interest due to a diverse and abundant bat community. At least 10 bat species have been recorded roosting in the caves. The mine has been worked by different parties at different times during the past, which started in the 19th century by the Portuguese and ended its heyday in the 1930s. During the Second World War, the mine has been once controlled by the Japanese army, mining lead for military purposes. After the war, production resumed, but a drop in lead price undermined its operation. Eventually, the mine shut down in 1958. Here are some old photos showing the past mining compound, include the ore chute, the milled buildings, flotation cells, and also the dumping, the tailing dump. Let's take a look at the current view of the main cavern area. From the hill shade model derived from terrestrial wide light data collected in year 2020, we can locate some features such as shaft, open cut peat, military trench, and the main cavern at level six, which is our target for revitalization. When we enter the caverns, we can see the rock archway formed by four major rock pillars. The typical crown height is around four meters. Extensive rooms and interconnected edits are also found behind the cavern, which are fenced off by these metal grills. Our teams also have some adventure going inside the edit behind the grills at multiple mining levels. Most of them fork and branch into multiple galleries forming an interconnected rooms and pin and mine network. There are also vertical or steeply inclined shafts connecting to surface or to deeper levels. So for such an extensive and complex mine structures, how can we best understand its extent? We have considered several factors like handiness for such a remote, huge site, mobility inside the complex mines, efficiency and accuracy in mapping, data processing time, and it is concluded that mobile handheld laser scanner demonstrate its advantage over other means in which we can collect dense 3D data with device on hand while traversing those dark and narrow core space. It serves as a convenient equipment which makes our task manageable. This picture shows our teammates scanning the interior using the handheld laser scanner set horizon. In order to locate the 3D mine in our ground model, three controlled points has been set up outside the cavern. Scanning is fast and efficient, but it does take some time and efforts to process the point cloud data in software like GeoSlam and Cloud Compare. We need to geo-reference the data into Hong Kong local coordinates. We clear noise involving trees, we also carry out rigid transformation with reference to topographic data in order to align with our ground model. After all, we construct a mesh of the mine cave model using the Poisson surface reconstruction plugin in Cloud Compare. It enables us to recover sharp features and smooth surfaces, which are noise resilient. We also incorporate other information to assist our understanding of the mine. These include historical plans and maps of the Mahan and surface information like digital terrain model and aerial photos. And finally, this is our general interior view of the scan portion at the main cavern. We can see the overall extent and the connection between edits and the main cavern at the center. The grills we saw in previous slides are also indicated for reference. Some longitudinal views of the edits. The overall chamber and volume of the cavern can be clearly visualized in this 3D model. The scan portion represents the level six upper level of the complex mine system. Whereas we also try to reconstruct the two lower level mine network using historical maps and plans. These multiple levels are likely connected with ore passages in which ore can be transported downwards. 
The lower levels are connected to surface entrance or to the shoes to mill building. By integrating the 3D mine layout into the digital terrain model, we can visualize the underground context in a regional scale and a connection between surface features and subsurface network. One of the project objectives is to convert the cavern into a visitor education attraction. The scan mine model in 3D real depth forms the basis for designs such as vintage point platform, educational signage and exhibitions. The model also forms the basis for interactive tourist experience such as VR or AR while achieving minimum disturbance to mine structures and ecology. To conclude, we applied mobile handheld laser scanner to carry out mine cave mapping in an efficient mean. By building a 3D model, we can interactively present and visualize the underground features. The scan model forms the basis for design in terms of stability assessment and educational purposes. Thanks, and we would like to acknowledge the quality data, including 2020 LIDAR, a source from different government departments of Hong Kong SAR. Many thanks to the efforts of our teammate during field work and scanning. And special thanks to Mike and Kevin for the inspiration. Thank you, everyone. Right, so thank you very much, Francis Lee from uh, the Hong Kong Regional Group. Uh, we'll start with our in-house judges. If you've got any questions, then we'll move over to Karen online. Sorry, Jenny. Okay, Sh shall I start? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Francis. A really interesting talk. Um, my, one of my questions is to ask you, could you say a little bit more about the geology of the area in which the mine is? And so, for example, I'm curious, are all are all the levels in the same geology? Yeah, sure. Um, the geology is quite uniform. In this area is mainly dominated by coarse ash crystal tuff. In Hong Kong, we have classified this into the Tai Mo Shan formation. But for the vein, uh, for the quad vein, it is the target vein structures we are looking for in order to look for valuable ores like lights the uh, galena and pyrite. Great, thank you. And, uh, David? Hi, Francis, it's Dave here. Um, can I ask, I mean, we usually use the surface LIDAR to go looking for mine shafts. Were you able to reverse the process once you had the 3D model to extrapolate back to the surface where you may have a shaft hazard that you could go looking for and delineate on the ground surface using that underground model? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. This is a really nice idea. Because the powerful lighter data we use, we use it to like find out the shaft that there's this, there are hidden under vegetations. And most of them are really targeted and we go verify on site and we can really see it. And for some very minor one, when we go for the field mapping, we can, if we can like detect it and find it in the field mapping, we can incorporate into our model and our field mapping result. And this is an interactive uh, processes to make sure we can target everything we want from our field mapping and also with the help and support from the light data. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Karen, uh, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Hello, thank you very much, Francis. That was very interesting. I wonder, I can see the use of this for tourist activities at your, this mine, but I wonder if you could explain how your technique might be applied to other mines and other types of areas like this. Yeah, thanks. Um, it has been proven that using the handheld laser scanner can help us better understand records and also present and visualize the mine network to like normal general public, not only geologists or, or engineers. So if we can apply these techniques and use it to demonstrate and shows the mind extent and also the interconnected networks to the general public, that will be very interesting and also educational. Thank you. 
Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Francis, again from the Hong Kong Regional Group and to our judges as well. Thank uh, you. In that case, we'll shoot on to uh, Hester Clarence, who's representing the Central Scotland. Although Central Scotland didn't actually hold a, a regional heat, but uh, in lieu of that, the uh, Early Career Network on, uh, offers a wild card event. So any regional groups that don't, uh, those are our members of the society that can partake in that. So Hester, over to yourself. Hello, can you, I assume you can hear me well. Um, thank you very much to the Early Careers Network for putting this on today. Uh, and this will be my presentation on how we utilise geothermal energy within the UK. We're going to the next screen. Oh. Sorry about this. Can I just, I'm just going to sh stop sharing and reshare. It's not letting me move on. Yeah, sure, no worries. Try that again. Two seconds. Oh, no, it's just exited. Cool. Sorry, I've lost my screen completely now. Oh, one of the perks of a hybrid event. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for making this hybrid. I'm sorry I'm spoiling it. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Again, it's fantastic we can have this hybrid event so people who otherwise can't get to, to Burlington House can still partake. Brilliant. So I should be able to share. Share. Can you see that? Yes, we can. And can I skip? Fantastic. There we go. We're into it. Brilliant. So I am Hester Farage and I am your presenter today. Um, I've got an undergraduate graduate degree in geology and I've recently just achieved my master's in subsurface energy systems. Um, so I've worked as an exploration geologist at Cornish Lithium for a few years, and now I work up in Scotland as a geothermal geologist for a company called Tamrock Energy. Um, and I'm also a committee member for Women in Geothermal UK. So today's presentation will take us through what is geothermal energy and then how we can utilise it within the UK. Um, and hopefully there'll be some case studies along the way for you to get some context as well. So what is geothermal energy? The word geothermal comes from geo meaning earth and thermal meaning heat. And the core of the earth is at a temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius. And just 0.1% of this could supply humanity's total energy needs for 2 million years. The earth is continually producing heat from radioactive isotopes, which release energy when they decay. And this is a massive inexhaustible heat source that's just right beneath our feet. But we don't feel it at the surface. And that's because the layers of earth act as a great insulator. Heat moves to the surface through a network of fluid filled spaces in the rock, which are called pores. And as these pores are interconnected, it's known as permeability, fluid holding this heat energy can flow to the surface. So geothermal resources range in a, um, from high to low entropy around the world. Traditionally, we think of geothermal energy from being high entropy resources. So such as geysers or volcanoes or hot springs. And we associate these with places such as New Zealand and Iceland and Hawaii. However, in the UK, our volcanoes are long extinct and we sit above very old cold rocks, meaning we have something called a low entropy resource. And this means we have to go a lot deeper to get the hotter temperatures. And this has been unappealing for many, many years as we have gallons of, or we did have gallons of cheaply produced offshore gas. However, with climate goals in our sight lines and suddenly this geothermal energy, the interest has completely spiked. So in the next few slides, hopefully I'll take you through how we can utilize it within the UK. So this diagram on the right uh, shows you a number of ways that geothermal energy can be used. Um, so we've got the shallow, shallowest options of ground source heat pumps, and then moving towards the right, we kind of increase in depth and we go to mine water, hot sedimentary aquifers, disused oil and gas wells, and then lastly, our granites or hot dry rocks. Um, so ground source heat pumps. So this is the shallower system and it's providing small amounts of geothermal energy for domestic uses uh, via a heat pump. So a series of pipe works are stored underground um, and low temperature heat from the subsurface is then absorbed into the system. This then passes through a heat exchanger into a heat pump and the heat pump usually uses a refrigerant which compresses the fluid to increase the temperature. This heat pump increases the temperature um, using very small amounts of electricity. And then the ground source uh, heat pumps can then be used for uh, domestic settings such as space heating um, and sometimes schools and hospitals. 
So a fabulous example of where this has been used is something called body heat. And this uses a series of wells and a ground source heat pump to create a new renewable space heating resource. So the system captures heat emitted from dancers and stores the thermal energy in 12 boreholes at around 200 meters depth. And this provides two heating systems for the venue. Firstly, a cooling mode, whereby heat is extracted from the heat space, uh, from the event space, sorry, and cools the venue. And then this heat is transferred into the boreholes for storage. Secondly, when the event venue requires heating, the heat, is, heat energy is then extracted from the boreholes and the thermal energy is passed through a heat pump to elevate the temperatures and then it's used for heating purposes. Um, so a pilot project is currently being built in an events venue in Glasgow um, and will be commissioned uh, in August. Oh, we've gone backwards. So next we have mine water energy. So we're moving a little bit deeper now. Um, so the UK has a long legacy of coal mining concentrating in North and in Scotland and metal mining in the Southwest. So these now flooded coal mines have considerable geothermal resources with 25% of homes in the UK lying above this resource. So heat energy is extracted from the deep coal seams and the heat energy is then extracted for use at surface sometimes using heat pumps to elevate it to, uh, to a higher degree. And then it's re-injected into the deeper coal seams. Um, the system can be used again for space heating or for higher industrial uh, uses. So an example or a case study of this uh, can be found in Gateshead near Newcastle. And it's the UK's largest and first multi-megawatt mine water heating system. So the system heats a large warehouse, a large wine warehouse, and it needs to be temperature controlled because of uh, what's, what it's storing. And there's two sites. So it, there's uh, site one and there's uh, site two, which I will just show you a diagram of here. So the two sites there that you can see, uh, the first site, uh, site two, um, has an abstraction well to the higher, high main um, coal seam and a discharge well to a much deeper Harvey Beaumont seam. And then site one um, has two discharge wells uh, to the high main seam and an abstraction well at a higher high main post seam. Um, so it's actually hoping this is gonna expand in an exploration project, which means that we'll be deepening the wells, uh, the, uh, the discharge wells and some of the abstraction wells to get uh, higher temperatures from these resources. So moving a little bit more deeper again, we're now looking at hot sedimentary aquifers. So aquifers hold vast amounts of water in sedimentary rocks within the subsurface, and they're heated by conduction from the surrounding subsurface. The map to the right here shows the depth of around one kilometer um, deep uh, at, in the UK surface. Um, and you can see that there are spikes kind of around these hot sedimentary aquifers. So in the south and kind of the, the middle, middle East kind of area. Um, and these, these systems, the water, the, geothermal energy, the water can be quite easily extracted from the system due to the high porosity and permeability of these aquifer rocks, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later when it comes to granites as well, or a lack of permeability. So next, uh, this is a really interesting area that's growing rapidly at the moment. And this is the, uh, the reuse of oil and gas wells. So as well as mining in the UK, we have a number of offshore and onshore oil and gas wells. And there's an emerging industry where we can repurpose these wells, um, which are which spent of hydrocarbons and are sitting, off of, sitting up on top of brine fields, essentially. However, there are many challenges associated with this. So, for example, if you're repurposing an offshore well, uh, you can't really ship the heat energy to shore uh, because it will, you know, you'll lose your energy by that point. Um, so do you use it directly on the rig or do you convert it to electricity? Do you perhaps convert it to electricity and then to hydrogen? So there's quite a lot of questions being thrown around this at the moment. So the diagram of, of the right um, kind of shows you how we can repurpose these wells. So um, the wells get PNA'd, um, plugged, and, plugged and abandoned at the base, and then we can turn them into a coaxial system. So this means that the fluid flows down the outside, becomes heated up, and then can flow up through the central annulus. Um, so this is uh, something that's happening at the moment in many places. We don't, have a, we don't have an operation on it at the moment, but it's a really interesting area to watch. So lastly, we have granites or hot dry rocks, uh, which sits very close to my heart um, as I do, I'm a kind of granite, I do lots within the granites and the deep geothermal. 
Um, so granites have higher amounts of radioactive elements and therefore produce more heat and have increased thermal gradients. However, they are crystalline rocks. So as we spoke about earlier, with the hot sedimentary aquifers having high amounts of porosity and permeability, uh, granites have hardly any. So when you want to target the fluid flow within these rocks, you want to target the faults. Um, the traditional system for these types of geothermal plays is a doublet system, whereby you have a deep production well, and we're talking five kilometers depth here, uh, which extracts the geothermal fluids, and then a shallower injection well, about two kilometers above. Um, so when you've extracted your heat energy, you re-inject it into, into, the, into the well, and then in theory, it trickles down through the fault and then becomes recharged with heat energy and can be produced again. So temperatures we're looking at here are targeted between 130 to 200 degrees, dependent on your thermal gradient and the depth you're aiming for. And at 200 degrees, you're starting to be able to produce electricity, which is really exciting. So a case study of this is, uh, I'm sure you're well aware of the two projects happening in Cornwall. Um, I've chosen the Eden project uh, to have a look at this one. So Cornwall and Devon, and Devon sit above a really large granite baffle. And uh, due to the faulting structure in Cornwall, it has very large north-south trending faults. And these are coll colloquially known as cross courses. And these faults sit within an extensional regime, which means that they are open in that direction. So they are open at depth and fluid is allowed to flow. So the Eden project has drilled one well to over five kilometers into this fault. Um, and they're currently installing what is known as a coaxial system where like the, uh, the oil and gas wells, the fluid will go down the outside and then re-up through the inner annulus. Um, to use, um, they're gonna then use, utilize this heat for the nearby biomes at the Eden project. So in conclusion, uh, the UK does not sit on traditional high temperature resources. However, we don't need high energy resources for decarbonized heat. Currently 45% of the UK's energy demand is in heating. And this results in 32% of the UK's carbon emissions. And we can utilize geothermal energy to help us decarbonize heat and reach the net zero goals by 2030. And it's incredibly important that the UK realizes its potential and incorporates geothermal into the energy strategy. So lastly, what's next? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully a few more deep geothermal projects will uh, spring up within, uh, within the granites in the UK. Um, and I'll just leave you with a, uh, a little tip bit, which is if the last decade was the decade of renewable electricity, uh, this decade is the decade of renewable heating. So thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Hester, again representing South uh, Central Scotland. Um, since there was a mention of Cornwall, uh, Karen, should we head to you first for the question? Thanks very much. Um, hi, Hester, that was very interesting. Thanks, good to see Cornwall in there. Um, I wonder if you could give us an idea of which of the, the types of geothermal that you've shown to us have the most potential to give the UK the most energy? That's a, it's a really interesting question because we, as, as kind of, as our consult, as a geothermal consultancy, we kind of get pulled where the market wants us. And recent, well, in the last kind of year or so, uh, mine water has been a fantastic topic because a lot of councils sit on top of it and they realize they need to decarbonize and they realize they sit on top of these immense reserves. And it's relatively inexpensive as well compared to your deep geothermal projects where we're talking multi-millions of pounds. But actually a mine water project can be quite concise um, and can be, you know, we're talking way less than a million pounds to develop a system. So that's become a lot more appealing, especially to local councils um, and heating networks. Um, I love a deep geothermal project. I just think they're brilliant. So I, I'm biased towards deep geothermal, but I do think the market definitely, especially in the UK at the moment, is, is driving us towards mine energy in the North and Scotland where the mines are not as problematic as they are in the Southwest. It's a different case in the Southwest. <laughs> right. Well noted, thank you very much. So who's got the microphone? David, all right, there you go. Microphone now. So hi, Hester. Um, I was going to ask, we're obviously seeing with, with many of the sort of renewable energies and um, if you like fossil energies, there are negatives associated with their production, you know, wind farms, visual impact, etc. What would you say were potentially some of the negative impacts of some of the geothermal systems? Yeah, so um, this is a, a very interesting question. It's something that we get asked to produce a lot. It's kind of a risk register um, and kind of find out what the risks are. And uh, with the deep geothermal, um, 
your risks are looking at, you know, you're extracting from a fault, a fault regime. So you've got the issue there of induced seismicity. Um, and there's a lot of concern from the public also about water contamination. Um, luckily with deep geothermal projects, uh, oil and gas industry have made drilling pretty exceptional in the way that it doesn't interact with the water table. So we've got a lot of mitigation strategies attached to that. Um, however, with the induced seismicity, it's something that does always sit at the back of people's minds, especially when bigger projects abroad have caused seismic events. So it's more the risk from the public's perspective is this induced seismicity. As we get shallower and shallower, uh, the risks do decrease, thankfully. Um, so, but with uh, mine water energy, for example, we still have that water table interaction, uh, but we also have stuff like substance that comes into it. Um, and we've got to take into consideration about, you know, the extraction and the open mine workings that we're dealing with can cause compaction of the earth um, and subsidence, um, you know, which uh, can affect your housing, as you know, can cause cracks in the walls and stuff. Um, so, Again, that, that can cause a few issues and be um, high on people's minds, especially with the public perception of it. But it does decrease from the deep geothermal projects, which have the biggest risks associated with it. And Jenny. Yeah, hello. So um, we have a lot of granites in the UK. I'm thinking in Cornwall, the Lake District, Scotland. Do you think we could extract heat from all of those granites? Yeah, so this is a fantastic question. And it's um, something as of working up in Scotland, we really want to get the first deep geothermal well in, in Scotland. Um, and though in the 1980s, when exploration into kind of, uh, granites uh, was first looked into, the Cornish granites were definitely highlighted as really high heat producing um, granites. But actually what they've come to realize recently in uh, the integration of the work of a guy called Gosnold in 2005 and then Westerway and Younger in 2013 um, is that the granites in the north and in Scotland in England have uh, the last glaciation came down further than initially thought. So the top 2,500 meters of the granites have been um, affected more and cooled more. Um, so they've got some, this thing called a paleoclimatic effect, which means that our heat production data um, is essentially a lot colder uh, at surface. However, once we, once, once we drill past this 2,500 meter section, the granites are thought to be uh, equal in heat producing as they are in the Cornish granites. So there really is uh, some fantastic reserves there, but there's no uh, boreholes on a granite in Scotland deep than 300 meters. So at the moment, it's trying to get the funding and the backing so that we can um, get a well that gets under this paleoclimatic effect. Thank you, Hester. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Hester, again. Um, now we're going to move on to Hannah Oliphant, who's representing the South uh, Wales Regional Group. Uh, Hannah, there you are, lovely. Hello. And all good to go, I think. Great. I'll show my screen. Hello. Uh, so today I'd like to talk to you about the Brecon Bypass Landslip Scheme. So a little about myself first. In 2020, I graduated from Cardiff University with an MSc in Applied Environmental Geology. Over the last two years since graduating, I've worked as an engineering geologist at Mott McDonald, who are an engineering consultancy firm. My key projects over the last two years have been focused around landslips. So the scope of the presentation, I will introduce the scheme and the site setting. I will cover the project work stages, my role during construction, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So the landslip is located near the town of Brecon, north of the Brecon Beacons, a mountainous region in South Wales. The landslip occurred on the 16th of February 2020 above the concrete crib wall, which retains the westbound cutting of the, of the bypass. This photo was taken the day after the landslip. 300 tonnes, so 15 lorry loads of debris, covered the dual carriageway, leading to a full road closure. The drone, here's a drone picture from 2021, so before any construction began. And to pick out a few key features, the landslip comprises of a steep back scar, 15 metres in length and three metres in height. Um, it's clo in close proximity to the bypass, as you can see in the photo, um, which is why Welsh Government had to come up with a remedial solution, ultimately for the safety of the road users and because the bypass is strategically important for rural connectivity. 
I'm now going to talk through the project work stages as shown on the left here. And through each of these stages, information was collected to inform the remediation design. So stage one is the desktop review. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I've picked out the three highlighted in yellow. Um, these topics are important for understanding the development of the site and its geotechnical challenges. So the BGS sheet map indicated that the site comprised of St. Maun's formation. This unit is described as generally a red, brown, mudstone, siltstone or sandstone with calcretes and conglomerate. From this information, we can start making assumptions about what the rock engineering characteristics are and the associated geotechnical risks, i.e. mudstones are generally more easily weathered than other sedimentary rocks. Hydrogeology, we've got three key rock types. What are the differences in permeability between these three different layers? Will the interbedded nature of the geology create favorable sliding planes? And with cow creeks, is there a possibility for localized dissolution features? Superficial deposits encountered in the Brecon district are complex and varied in both nature and extent. As you can see from the BGS sheet map extract in the top corner, periods of glaciation and deglaciation are largely responsible for the deposits present. However, as you can see from this map, no superficial deposits have been mapped in the area of the landslip. Nevertheless, the location of the site on the valley side and in an area that has been previously glaciated suggests that glacial deposits would likely be encountered at the site. The asphalt drawings were interesting. This landslip, which is marked in red, um, is located between two downslope drains. This photo on the left shows wire mesh netting overhanging the landslip back scar. Um, here's a close up of it. The use of drainage me measures, topsoil netting, and rock fill as stabilizing layers um, pointed to groundwater and slope instability were likely recognized as significant problems in the latter stages of design or during construction itself. So rainfall data analysis, having such a large data set enabled us to identify anomalies in the data, including the February 2020 Storm Dennis. Storm Dennis impacted the UK between the 15th and 16th of February 2020, just one week after Storm Kira also brought heavy rain to the whole of the UK. Between 9am on the 15th and 9am on the 17th, so two days, 99 millimetres of rainfall was recorded at the rain gauge bearing in mind the average rainfall in February for Wales is 110.8 millimetres. Storm Dennis was the second highly daily rainfall recorded since the construction of the bypass. The highest daily rainfall was Storm Callum with 105.8 millimetres of rain in one day. The high, um, however, if we look at combining Storm Dennis with the rainfall received in the week prior, a total of 199 millimetres of rainfall was recorded over a nine day period. And by comparison, over the same length period, a total of 151 millimetres was recorded during Storm Callum. So as you probably guessed, here I'm alluding to one of the causes of the landslip. The one day rainfall associated with Storm Dennis was not enough in isolation to initiate the landslip. Had this been the case, the landslip would have occurred during Storm Callum. Therefore, the prolonged heavy rainfall prior to Storm Dennis is considered a proprietary factor to failure and thus contributed to causing the landslip. Storm Dennis acted as the triggering event. Next one to the um, rock mapping. So bedrock was mapped at a nearby outcrop. Um, here is the dip and strike data we collected. And this stereographic projection um, presents the table, um, data from the table. This enabled us to assess whether the discontinuities were favorable or unfavorable orientations for sliding. The bedding was found to typically dip five to 18 degrees south, so into the slope which is favorable. Next on the work stages, we have um, stake monitoring. In order to mitigate the geotechnical risk in the short term, Mock McDonald set up a basic slope monitoring regime to identify any slope movements. Stakes were aligned beneath the tension crack as seen here on this photo. Over a one year period, myself and a colleague undertook routine and reactive inspections, um, taking inclination readings in both the downslope and cross slope direction. Here's the results from my last inspection before construction began. There was a possible overall cumulative inclination change in a general northward and eastward direction, but nothing too alarming. The purpose of the GI investigation was to investigate the depth, extent, and nature of both the superficial and bedrock materials. A borehole map plan, which is shown on the left, 
shows that nine boreholes were undertaken using a slope for climbing rig. As seen in the video of the lift, the site had many um, access challenges. The crib wall along the bottom of the slope, which the rigs had to be lifted up and over, as well as the site being tall and unusually steep. Groundwater monitoring. Groundwater monitoring was undertaken using piezometers. Diver data loggers recorded groundwater at hourly intervals within specific response zones. Uh, groundwater peaks correlated to rainfall peaks, so storm events. The superficial deposits are granular in nature, so their hydrographs showed a flashy response to rainfall, whereas the bedrock generally showed um, little response to rainfall. And notably, the groundwater levels were depressed near the slope drains. What caused the landslip? As we've established, Storm Dennis was likely the triggering event. However, by collating the information we've learned, numerous factors contributed to its cause, including the ones listed on the slide. From an inspection visit captured in this photo, you can see water egressing from the landslip back scar. This enabled us to conclude that a spring flowing through the superficial deposits likely contributed to causing the landslip. Now on to design. So we make a conceptual model. This model collates the information we've learned so far. The de designer relies upon this information to prevent further instability in the area. The remediation solution that we used comprised of a gabion wall to retain the upper slope, back of wall drainage and um, granular fill to collect um, groundwater flows out of the slope drainage banker on the mid slope area to catch any further flows. We identified an area of seepage as marked on the conceptual model. So this, um, this collected that water. And further west along the slope, we've got a cascade, which catches the water outfalling from the gabion back of all drainage. And this continues over the crib wall face and into the verge, um, existing verge drain. You may be thinking, why such a large expensive repair? This is designed as a long-term repair with a 120-year design life. The robust structure should be resilient to Wales's climate and changing climate, and so prevent landslip reoccurrence in this area. This aligns with Welsh Government's Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, which is about cre um, creating a prosperous and resilient Wales. So my role um, on site. In October 2020, I was supervising the ground investigation but over the last nine months, I've been on site for the construction of the remedial solution. Day to day, I ensure the contractor are built into the design drawings, answer questions they have about the design. And when we encounter problems, I liaise between the contractor, client and the designer to get a resolution. I also look out for health and safety um, issues on the site. For people listening who are at uni or early in their careers, I'd like to stress how much I've um, benefited from my time on site. I've learned such a um, I've learned a lot in such a short um, space of time. I'm moving forward to other schemes now. I know how to recognise different fill materials, how a slope should be branched, um, how to get a good formation, whether that be for gabion baskets or other structures, um, what to keep note of day to day, safety issues to look out for, and how to respond to technical queries and requests for information. It's been a really great scheme to learn from, and I encourage anyone to jump at site opportunities. Some of the challenges I faced um, on site include um, temporary cut face instability, intervening in um, safety issues, controlling or asking the contractor to control um, water runoff as winter isn't the best time to do a slope stability project. Um, as an example of one of the geotechnical challenge I encountered, um, this is presented on my final slide. Here it is, a shelf-like bedrock feature, which is spray painted in yellow in the top left photo. Um, what this meant is Rockhead was um, higher than anticipated. Um, this wasn't picked up at the GI because it was between two borehole points. So as you can see here, it was between borehole one, uh, 104 and 105. What are the implications of this? So cost, we had to get a pecker on site to break out the rock. Time, we had to extend the program. And I think this is a good example of why we do a ground investigation and the benefit of a G um, each GI point brings to a scheme. Obviously, there's a cost benefit analysis to do here as well. And that's everything. Thanks for listening. I'll leave you with a few drone photos from the site, which are from last month. Thanks.
Hey, thank you very much, hi, from uh, South Wales. Uh, who's got the microphone this time? David, do you want to go first? Oh, hi, Hannah. My, my question is going to be really when you sort of look at this, this kind of holistic model and you're, you start by developing the conceptual ground model, which do you think really you should focus on at the beginning as one of the, the key components? Is it the geology, the geomorphology or the climatic sort of weather rainfall related data? Which do you think was the sort of the key of unlocking the understanding of this particular landslide? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I think here, partly the well, the hydrogeology, because we needed to know where the flows of groundwater are. And as you saw in the as it will the landslip occurred between two downslope drains. So why in that area? Probably because we've got water in the slope and as we saw that spring. Um, but the geology was important as well because it was um, a sliding plane. Um, the superficial slid over the um, bedrock. So we needed to know what, how, what type of um, landslide it was in the first place to be able to prevent it happening again. Um, but the Gabion baskets that we built on the site here, and you can see in this um, image at the front, um, they sit on bedrock. So that's um, so then the fill behind that is just supporting the superficial deposits above. So that was important to know where the bedrock was as well. Thank you, Jenny. Not picking the sound. Not switching on, is it? Uh, give us uh, 30 seconds, we'll try and find another microphone. like it will. Voila, there we go. Hello, Hannah. Hello. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. So I have a question about the superficial deposits that you, you mentioned a lot in, in the talk. Um, I think earlier in the talk, you said that um, on the geologic maps, there were no superficial deposits marked. Um, but uh, now you've had good views of the exposure of the superficial deposits, I presume. Can you tell therefore what type of deposits they are? And, and a related question is that, are there likely to be other places along this road where failure might happen with heavy rainfall? Yeah, Thank sure. Um, so firstly, the superficial deposits, we think these are hill wash deposits. So they have, um, so they, they're mainly silts and sands with some gravels, but because they're on the bottom of the valley, um, they've likely had water running over them for a long, well, the last 10,000 years or so since the last um, deglaciation. Um, so they've had a chance to be reworked. Um, there was also no, um, they were also uh, poorly sorted and poorly stratified. And when we were looking in the landslip back scar, you couldn't see any class, um, class implication. So we, it didn't look like they were all in facing one way. Um, so yeah, we thought they were hill wash. Um, and in, so, so you, it was also hard to tell because the site is obviously on the side of a cutting. When they were doing the cutting itself, they would have likely um, put some of the material they extracted onto the slope and some of the sediments were site one, but were put there and we worked. So some of it would have been made ground and we couldn't tell the difference between the made ground and the natural deposits as it is. Um, as for the rest of the cutting, yes, there's definitely um, a possibility for sliding in other parts as well. The drainage um, features across, so it's a 400 meter cutting are extensive and irregular. So that probably showed that there was um, slope stability issues or loads, uh, lots of groundwater during construction. Um, about 300 metres um, east on the scheme, we had a washout type feature um, during the construction of this, so over the last two years. And that was where the superficials washed out through the crib wall and onto the road surface below. And we found that was related to a spring and that was last winter during the heavy rainfall again. 
Um, but part of the scheme, which I haven't mentioned because there's lots of different elements to it, was renewing the whole of the crest drain, so 400 metres. And we hope that that helps to alleviate water in the rest of the slope and so should prevent issues like this happening in the future in other parts of the slope. Thank you very much for that comprehensive answer. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. Much appreciated. Um, I think now we've got our first in-person speaker, Lydia Rula from the... Oh, sorry, Karen. <laughs> My apologies. Karen, question from yourself. Uh, no worries. That's fine. I just have a short question, actually, Hannah. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. I wonder if you could outline just a couple of the ways that you feel that your degree prepared you for this work. Sure. Um, so my master's degree, which was applied, um, taught us um, how to do dip and strike measurements and um, the applied nature was about doing death studies, what to look out for in construction, um, what um, the client contractor relationship was and whether you wanted to be a contractor or a consultant. So it explained a lot of like what the industry is like, which I think really helps day to day, actually, when you that's first enter the workplace, what, what you're to expect. Absolutely. No, it's great to know. Thank you. Thanks. OK, this time, got thrown by the microphone. Thank you again, uh, Hannah, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you yourself. We'll just get your slides up. As before, front back, yeah, front back. And then the laser pointer, white one. Okay, that's fine. They can take their time. <laughs> that's the one. Okay, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Today I'll be presenting um, some lessons learned for as a new graduate since I finished my final year project, which was about 12 months ago at the University of Portsmouth. Um, and thank you to the team that I work with. I've been able to reflect upon the quality of the conclusions and the way my report was presented, my findings. And of course, the advantage of having a presentation today is that I can take the extracts that I had reported on and expand them a little bit more and differently to what I'd done previously. So. Um, today I'm going to give you an overview of a ground characterization and proposed preliminary design for an underbridge in Slod in Scotland. Due to the knock-on effects of the pandemic, the typical route for a final year project would be uh, going on a company placement, collecting your own data, whether it's a mapping or a desk study, um, but that didn't happen. So thankfully the, our university reached out to industry contacts and we were able to gain some data from the A9 Dueling programme. Um, I'm not going to try any technical stuff today, but I will explain what this video is, which is a flyover of the scheme later in the presentation. So my project had two aims and objectives, um, which was firstly to produce a geological model um, of the area in greater detail than what's currently mapped by the BGS, which is at one to 50,000. And then secondly, my objective was to provide some recommendations for further design through hand calculations and modeling using OAC's Greta. Uh, for context, the A9 Dueling Programme plans to upgrade 129 kilometres of um, road in Scotland, which includes the reconstruction, as shown on the left image here, of um, the A9 between Dalar, Dal, Raddy and Slod, which includes my study area just up to the north there. Um, part of that redevelopment is an underbridge, which is uh, shown in this better image here, where it's labelled, um, which will connect the National Cycle Network to um, the new A9 drill carriageway to improve better road safety. The site is located within the Scottish Highlands on the northern border of the Carngorns National Park, which is 25 kilometres south of Inverness. And currently the land is all open grassland, apart from there are some residential dwellings down to the south there. And then we've got the live road and the railway line that crosses through it. From the reveal of historical mapping, there were two instances of historical quarrying, as shown by the outcutting bound by the railway line as well. Um, but these were marked as being disused by the 1970s, but it was a consideration about what, whether they were infilled and any contamination that may be present in those soils. Um, in addition to that, there was um, a redevelopment done in the 1960s, just north of my study area on the A9 that had issues with um, differential settlement and acidity in the groundwater due to heat that was found at great depths or bigger than what they anticipated to be back then. So the... Um, existing geological information that I reviewed for my project showed that the area has a history of glaciation and in part shown by the large amounts of glacial till, rock talus and glacial fluvial deposits that are present from old meltwater channels. 
I've, in addition, there are large amounts of peat distributed across the site, and it's also expected they won't necessarily be where they are mapped. And um, then there's a large amount of alluvium to the east from the River Delmain. Um, and it's anticipated that these deposits would have a wide range of behaviours, um, such as shrink and swell and high plasticity, and therefore consideration for the preliminary design would be to include maybe excavating out these materials or um, to avoid a differential settlement and piling beneath them into more competent strata. The glacial deposits from the reveal were found to be of moderately high groundwater productivity. So again, groundwater flow and instability within any of these foundations would be important. Whilst the bedrock of the study area is what I would say is representative of my knowledge of Scotland and that it was very complex. My understanding from the geological history is that um, the bedrock consists of gneissose rocks of the Darva group deposited in the early Neoproterozoic, underlying the Darradian subgroup consisting of semi pellite and samite rocks deposited in the late Neoproterozoic, which accumulated during rift basin cycles. From bedrock exposures in the rock cuts, the boundary between the lithologies is heavily affected by ductile shearing, which likely occurred during orogenic building events such as the Grampian and um, Caledonian, uh, Caledonian events. And then finally, there's an intrusion of um, the dike super sweet, um, which occurred during the late Silurian. The evidence for multiple deformation events is shown through steeply dipping foliations and abundant shear zones trending north to south on the site. And during the ground investigation, groundwater was frequently encountered within the first three meters of the superficial deposits of both the glil, till, and the alluvium, whilst there were some deeper groundwater strikes about 18 meters, so likely flowing along bedrock fractures. The ground investigation consisted of a typical um, intrusive GI, but there was also some geophysical data made available to us. And the constraints for this GI was that it was working within a national park, you have the light roadway and unexpected ground conditions. So as PG mentioned, there were two locations of geophysical surveys carried out within the study area. We've got resistivity data from the north and then we've got seismic data from the south. Sadly, we weren't provided with any of these returned values that came back and just these um, models that were given through to us. However, I did add on the relation of the boreholes, etc. Um, it did provide a good insight into the subsurface and was effective at delineating superficial deposits to um, the, from the glacier, glacial deposits, but not necessarily their compositional layers. Um, as shown in the top images from the resistivity data, there was a large variation in colour, and I interpreted this as the higher pore pressures showed the saturated superficial ground, which is coloured blue through green, and typically was shown um, downslope, so probably was controlling the stability. And then the regions of greater resistivity values are orange through red. The bottom two images there show the seismic data, which wasn't as useful as showing the composition um, due to the resolution. Um, at such other depths. And in addition, it was noted that they did have some interference from the live railway when they're working and due to the weather. So, but from boreholes nearby, bedrock was found at about seven and a half meters, which roughly correlates to that dark blue mass. And then it's anticipated the pink and the light blue will be the superficial or very weathered bedrock. When I was doing my project, I did research into how to correlate undrained shear strength data. Um, and at the time, I believed that doing an average of three would be a sensible approach. And I do still agree with that. But since um, I started working, gained a greater understanding of how these der derivations are used, um, I've since gone over and adjusted them slightly or shown what I don't think is as appropriate. For example, the glacial fugal silt and sand deposits, um, I don't think is so suitable to use the Stroud correlation as that's preliminary for fine grain sealed, especially when I've got the balacandrin um, derivative, which was specifically made for glacial tills and therefore is more appropriate and gonna give a better characteristic value for that material. In addition, the made grounds that was encountered on the site, it's not suitable for me to use Parsons or balacandrin because these are both for glacial till deposits. And in addition, trying to classify a non-homogeneous and highly variable material such as made ground isn't necessarily gonna work out particularly well. Despite this, on the right-hand side, I have my derived geotechnical parameters. Um, that I produced and later go on to inform my preliminary design check of the um, abutment. Again, in the industry, I've learned and inputting into these factual reports that go on to inform the design, um, including parameters such as the drained and undrained Young's modulus, as well as the bulk unit weight for hand calculation modeling would have been particularly useful. Another set of data that was given to us was um, from the rock mass surveying and site walkover for the rock discontinuities. The I did and analysis and S wedge, which is shown down here, or one of the models was, um, and it did show that these joint sets do intersect. So failure is probable, and I'm not sure if it's too visible on that image on the top. However, there is lots of rock netting up on that road already, so it's clear that there are failures happening along the road. And whilst I didn't do any further analysis of this information, it 
would be important when thinking about orientating a cutting within these rock slopes um, at the bridge foundations to prevent any failures. The area, as I've already alluded to, was subject to glacial erosion and deposition pro processes, most significantly during the Wallastonian, um, where a large mass of ice was present. And this regressed through early to mid Devensian and then finally deglaciation all the way up until the Holocene. The evidence of the impact of the landscape from the last British Irish ice sheet includes the striated bedrock, which is shown in the British image on the left there, or the right for you guys. Uh, no, it's left for you. Um, and the abundant meltwater channels in the north by Slod Summit, and then in the left by Slod Newt. Sorry for the orientation, it's sort of centered in the middle of the image there. I hope that's visible. And then to the right, I have a copy of my drawn geomorphological map um, that I constructed, which was created by reviewing the two meter resolution data from Digimaps. And then I um, edited that using the automated terrain model, Autorain terrain analysis tool Hillshade in ArcGIS. Sadly, I don't have a copy of that anymore because it's on my uni drive. Um, however, you do have the map that I made. Um, and it did show the effect of glacial processes with the Hummocky Glacial Terrain down in the southeast, um, as well as these irregular gulls towards the north. Now, since reviewing these features when I was compiling this presentation and talking to colleagues at work, it's likely not all of these are actually from um, the effect of the glacier and potentially, especially this cut, this gull by the road, is more likely to be an unmarked disused quarry in the area instead, but didn't have any info. So the final output of my first project objective was to produce this one to 10,000 geological map created from reviewing the site investigation data, the geomorphological map and reviewing the current site geology. Um, some of the changes compared to the one to 50,000 map is that the dike suite is shown to be more extensive where it was found on site and in boreholes and as well as the outcropping of the down radian subgroup down in the south there. Um, then moving on to my second project objective, I concluded a sensible approach would be to design said abutment as a cantilever retaining wall due to my knowledge of very small bridges. Um, due to the relatively small height of the abutment and location in the upper part of the embankment fill, I concluded that the lateral earth pressures and structure would be lower than a conventional full site, full height abutment, as they are less susceptible to um, overturning and sliding. These checks were carried out by hand calculations, and then these went on to inform um, the design that I modelled in Oasis Greta. So for the preliminary design of the footbridge foundation and abutment, it was checked against overturning, sliding, bare capacity and settlement, and it was safe to get all of them under ultimate limits design. The hand calculations designed were to be safe under both ultimate limit state and the uh, stability limit checking. Um, and the design from these um, were used in my Oasis Greta, so there weren't any stability problems, so deep piling into the bedrock would not necessarily be necessary for it. And thank you very much for this tour of my project. Thank you very much, Lydia from uh, Thames Valley Regional Group. Um, Karen, I'm going to come to you this time first. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Looks like you got out in the field quite a lot as well. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, you really focused on the geology and geomorphology, and that was your aim of your project. But I wonder in going further with maybe putting in this installation that you've designed, what other factors do you think are important to study in the area? Um, well, actually, I never visited my site because it oh, was sorry. all of this was virtual, which made of it course. an interesting project. No, that's quite okay. Um, <laughs> I suppose there are many aspects to consider with a further design of this, and I'm at the very beginning of my career, so I'm not too sure. However, from what I do know, um, I never classified any of the, if I just go back a slide, I did it simply as my superficial deposits are in the green there and the yellow is the made ground and embankment fill. And so I now know that there are, just classifying it all as superficial and glacial isn't particularly helpful when there are different compositions of material in there and they're gonna have different parameters. So you definitely need a more detailed model before doing anything with this um, and much greater checks. So hopefully that answers your Brilliant. question. Thank you. That's help. That's great. Hello, Lydia. Thank you very much for an interesting talk about Scotland, one of my favourite places. Um, I was going to ask, please, you showed a map um, that have various glacial features. What do those meltwater channels represent? In other words, how did they form? Oh Do goodness, you know? that's testing my history of this. Um, yes, there was, from my knowledge, there was a large, there were two masses of ice and it's very terrainy and that's not a very good word for it, but 
you've got the large hill up into the northeast of this area um, and the ice blocks got wedged towards the north and you've got draining into the river down lane there's actually a viaduct that's just down by Stodnewick and um, so the river channels are still there today but they were draining off of the glacier and erosion was happening subglacially is my understanding of the area. That's lovely thank you. Hi Lydia, um, my, my question was interested in you, you're starting to look at the SPT correlations and starting to sort of <laughs> derive a little bit from them. But what's your view on, on the use of N and N60 and then these extrapolations to try and look at sort of ground strength? Do you think it, it's something that can be widely used or it's just very idiosyncratic? I've learned since that I did my research for my project, obviously, but there are so many different correlations out there that are all for these very specific types of material that you know, it, I chose three and thought an average of all of them would be a good idea, but I probably, they shouldn't all be comparing to each other. And I know currently at work, we try to only have one correlation if possible, rather than you have multiple that you're deriving across because one of them's only got the MCV or one of them's got the N value from the SPT. So you don't always have the same data sets for all your materials. And as you say, the more correlations you do, the less valid your data is probably gonna be when you're modeling it. However, it's always, always very conservative. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Lydia. Uh, next up is uh, Romney Porter representing the uh, West Midlands Regional Group. So we'll just uh, make sure your slides come up as well. Just as a refresher, front, back, laser. Voila. Okay, and there's your slides. Thank you. Hi all, my presentation is on a semi-automated approach to a coal mining risk assessment. So I'm gonna go over what a coal mining risk assessment is, risks from historical mine workings, what data is used to produce a coal mining risk assessment, a project example I, hate, I helped produce a coal mining risk assessment for, then an introduction to our automated mining risk assessment toolkit, benefits and limitations for it, and some potential further work. So what is a coal mining risk assessment? It is conducted for areas within an area of a known or suspected history of coal mining, and it should identify the locations of hazards relating to coal mining and assess the risks to the site and the project. And they can help target ground investigation or the remediation of the area or to potentially avoid the hazards entirely. So Britain has a rich history of coal mining with coal fields located in the Midlands and the North of England, as well as South Wales. And we have evidence of coal mining in the UK dated back 5,000 years ago from the Bronze Age, as we found tools in coal seams dated back to this time. Shallow mining techniques would have been likely up until the 1800s, likely bell-shaped pits or shallow addicts, as they would have followed coal outcrops from the surface. And the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century brought about a higher need for coal to power their steam engines. So deep underground coal mining techniques were developed to aid in further coal extraction. However, coal has declined since the, since the mid 1900s due to a push for more greener energy. So there are many risks from historical mine workings, including mine entry collapses. This is when a near vertical access shaft or ventilation shaft collapses and the coal authority is notified of approximately 120 shaft incidents a year. The collapse of a shaft creates a crown hole which can daylight as surface subsidence and the zone of influence of this collapse zone depends on the mine shaft diameter and the overlying superficial deposit thickness and its composition. Underground workings themselves may also collapse creating surface subsidence and the subsidence is produced via void migration where the void of the worked seam transmits upwards through the overlying strata to the surface and there's a general rule of thumb of likelihood of collapse of a 10 to 1 ratio between the acceptable cover of rock to the working and the thickness of the worked seam. This is known as a 10T. And there are also additional caveats to this 10T to include the type of acceptable cover, such as superficial deposit type, and also for where you've got seams in close proximity, where one failure of one seam may compound the failure of another seam. Mine gases may also rise to the surface via permeable pathways, such as mine shafts, faults, and deep excavations, and they can be toxic 
and explosive. Contaminated mine water produced by the weathering of sulfide minerals such as pyrite in coal bearing strata can create acidic pollute polluted water, which can be aggressive to foundations and can pollute local water bodies. Poorly compacted and or contaminated spoil heaps or backfill material can lead to large settlement or differential settlement, and they can contain aggressive compounds to concrete, and they may lead to heat generation and spontaneous combustion. So what data is used in a mining risk assessment? It is usually coal authority and BGS data, both the free to use WMS layers, which are locked to a certain resolution, which means once you zoom in past that resolution, the data disappears entirely. And you can also use the purchase licensed shapefile data, which has more data and can be manipulated. Historical maps, local history books and existing reports can also be useful to potentially give information on the location of coal mining hazards. So this is an example of a coal mining abandonment plan and the purple lines shown here in the image represent the location of underground worked seams. And this helps you locate voids under the surface and translate to where you might get a collapse at surface level. <clears throat> so an example project where I helped create a coal mining risk assessment for was for an electrification scheme near Wigan. It was roughly 12 kilometers of existing railway in an area which is historically heavily undermined and it's predominantly in Pennine middle and Pennine lower coal measures with mainly glacial tilt superficial deposits. So the image on the right, if you can just about make out, that is a train which collapsed into a mine shaft in the 1800s, quite close to where this project was. So we knew there was quite a high risk of mine working and mine shaft collapse. So the approach we took to the mining risk assessment was to input all the available data from the previous reports into mapping software. And then we used freely available coal authority and BGS WMS layers to overlay this into the mapping software and to manually calculate the distance from the mining hazards to the scheme. We also calculated mine shaft collapse zones by hand using the available data. And additionally, long sections were produced manually to calculate which sections of the scheme might be within a 10T of a mine seam. From this, we found that there were multiple areas of the scheme that were high risk within a 10T of a coal seam, and three mine shafts were also identified to have their collapse zones within an influencing distance of the track. So the findings of the MRA were used to inform a mining specific ground investigation, which we ideally are going to use to help with remediation to avoid collapses when installing the OLE gantries. So an introduction to our automated mining risk assessment toolkit. So after conducting the mining risk assessment, we realized that the available data and analyzing this data was quite time consuming and quite repetitive. And due to the nature of the data, it could be fairly easy to create a toolkit which could interrogate the data and create a high detail, high risk identification. So this toolkit is coded in Python and uses licensed coal authority and BGS data to calculate the zone of influence from each hazard for individual sections of the route. And the toolkit also calculates the risk of each hazard to, to each section of the track using predetermined and changeable risk weightings. This is just an example of a small portion of the Python code we wrote for this toolkit. I think off the top of my head, there was about 2000 lines of Python code in total. So the toolkit produces an output schedule spreadsheet with the risks and their weightings for each section. This is a small snippet of the spreadsheet. There's lots more columns. And um, this allows the high risk areas to be quickly identified for a more in-depth assessment. The toolkit also produces a 3D model from the shape files, such as the topographic data shown in orange, the scheme alignment, which is this li linear line here, mine entry zones with their collapse zones in red, and the black data is where the coal authority thinks there have been underground mine workings. So this helps just visualize the risk to the scheme and also helps in the creation of a long section. So a, the long section is an auto, a semi-automated process where the toolkit automates the surfaces such as the top of, of the topography and the locations of coal and bedrock outcrops. All data relating to geological interpretation of the long section below ground is done manually with the help of BGS mapping. 
And the long section can be joined with the output schedule, this bit here, to produce a visual representation of where the risks are along the scheme. So some benefits of the toolkit are that an initial risk output schedule and plan drawings can be produced in a matter of hours as opposed to days or weeks. So for example, the project I helped with, that was about two weeks in total to produce the mining risk assessment, whereas this toolkit can analyze that same data in about two hours. There are also fewer human errors with a toolkit as it won't miscalculate or miss out data sets. And you can also change the risk ratings of the hazards and also change or alter the alignment or add a new alignment if the client decides they want to try something different. That would take maybe two hours to run again in a toolkit, but would take again weeks or days even to calculate by hand. However, there are some limitations. The data, the toolkit is dependent on the data you put in, and it does require the purchase of coal authority and BGS data, which can be quite expensive. So if the project has a small budget, it may not be practical to buy all this data when it might take a few days to do from WMS mapping by hand. The toolkit is also dependent on some user inputs, such as the weighting criteria of the hazards and other input parameters, such as the route alignment. And the BGS dip data, including angles, are manually picked from BGS mapping and converted to apparent dips for use in the long sections, which may give rise to human errors. So further work for the toolkit is to make the interface more user-friendly than the current Python script you have to run to use it, as well as to look into further automation of the long section creation and to potentially automate the georeferencing of abandonment plans. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, Rumini, again uh, from West Midlands. Uh, Ginny, do you want to start, David? Yep. Hi, thanks, Rumini. That was really interesting and in, in seeing some, some of the parallel things that um, I'm involved in, how you having to deal with some of these data and some of the errors in the data. Can, can you talk us through how you sort of chose the buffer zones around some of the coal mining related hazards and perhaps why you went down the Python route and perhaps not using the integrated tools within the GIS itself? Yeah, so I'll answer the second one first. So we, we were given ArcGIS to use as a project. And personally, the guys in my team prefer QGIS. So we felt that if we used Arc, we wouldn't be as confident with using their toolkit. So we thought, well, we know Python from like a ground level. So if we just code it in Python, you can run that as a script, which you can then put into Arc, as opposed to us try and work out how to use Arc, which would take a bit of the budget up. You know what I mean? And the, and the buffer zones, we use uh, Syria guidance mainly for the mineshaft collapse zones. So I think if I can go all the way back. So this is one of the Syria guidances we use to help with the mine shaft collapse zones. Um, the BGS does have some shapefile data on what civil structures and density they've got of the superficial deposit thicknesses. So we coded for using that to create a, and the depth, sorry, the depth and the density to create a fire angle, which we then use to create a mine shaft collapse zone. The Coal Authority does also have their own shaft collapse zone shapefile. We just want to double check that with our own kind of initiative. And for the actual route alignment, a lot of it was proposed to be on viaducts or tunnels or at grade. So we, we used um, our engineering judgment to go, if it's in a tunnel, it's probably gonna have a more of an interaction with um, below ground seams as opposed to mine shafts, where something built above ground on a big structure will more likely have more of an interaction with mine shafts. Thank you very much, Rimini. A very interesting talk. Um, I've got a couple of, of questions here, that, and they're not really related. Yep. So, so the first point is you mentioned mine gases that, that, that can be toxic and can be explosive. Yeah. Um, my first question is, is what kinds of uh, gases are we talking about, particularly related to the coal mining industry? So the one we identified as the main risk was methane. We had a landfill site adjacent to our root section and they had picked up in their monitoring that one of the coal seams nearby was emitting methane. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were, we identified that as a potential risk for the ground investigation that was going to go quite deep. 
Okay, thanks. And and the the other one is that you've developed this um, amazing toolkit, um, and is I didn't quite gather whether this just kind of belongs to you guys in your company, or whether you are selling it, yep. sharing it, or spreading it. Or, or what what kind of stage is the toolkit at? So this was very much a proof of concept. That was what we designed it for. It was designed for Northern Powerhouse Rail which is no longer a thing, mm -hmm. but um, we're not sure if we're selling it yet, but it is freely available on GitHub and GitLab. So you can search, um, I think it's coal mining proof of concept and it'll be from Atkins. And I think you can just download the shape files, not the shape files, sorry, the, the code and run it yourself, I think, if you'd like. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Karen as well. Uh, thanks, Rudy. Very interesting to see your work on the coal. Um, issues. Um, I just wonder, with your ground truthing and field work that you do sometimes, do you look at mine waters? And if so, what sort of parameters do you take into account? So ground truthing for this wasn't particularly possible. Um, we did do a few work walkover surveys, but obviously you can't tell where a coal seam is from a walkover survey. Um, due to the possession times of four hours on night shifts, again, it wasn't quite practical to ground truth where the coal, where we thought the coal shafts were, the mine shafts. But I, um, we did do targeted ground investigation, which helped to kind of identify just how thick the superficial deposits were and where mm. we were going to expect coal seams to be. That is still very much ongoing. We haven't got the factual report for that yet, but I, I think from that, that would help ground truth where we think the high risk zones are gonna be and for which um, gantries we're gonna have to do more of the Euro code design for like foundation, a shallow pad foundation as opposed to piling into it. Thank you. Ricky. Right, thank you very much once again, Rini. Um, our penultimate speaker is Robert Gross in the Western Regional Group. So do you wanna come up Robert? We'll get to your slides. And refresh it for yourself as well. Front, back, laser. Thank you. Voila. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob uh, from uh, Bristol. Uh, I'm an engineering geologist at um, Atkins, and I'll be talking on um, some uses of drones in ground engineering. And this will be from some experience of using them um, as part of a framework with uh, Gloucestershire County Council. Um, so in my presentation, I'll go over uh, why we decided to use drones, uh, what are some of the rules of using them, uh, some of our uh, preliminary results, and then some lessons learned. Um, so I'm, I'm involved with a framework with Gloucestershire County Council, where I help inspect and monitor uh, their road network. Um, the image on the right is... Um, a uh, map showing some of the landslide deposits between Gloucester and Stroud. Uh, that's just in the hashed area. Um, these are associated with the uh, famous Cotswold terrain. And as you can see, there's quite a few uh, main roads which pass over this area. And when I talk about landslide deposits, I don't mean the uh, catastrophic ones we see on uh, social media, but rather the one, these ones, they move at a rate of approximately uh, one to a hundred millimeters per year. Um, so though they're slow moving, over time, these can cause uh, this can cause um, uh, damage to roads in the form of substance and cracking, um, which can be costly to the council for uh, repairing and resurfacing. Uh, so the image on the left is an example of a, a road in need of repair. Uh, so why did we decide to use drones? So um, during our inspections, we can take these out of us and take pictures we can um, put these pictures together using photogrammetry, and this will allow us to look at some of the geomorphological features around the road uh, to help better understand what processes are going on. Uh, there are restrictions of flying drones near rail and airports, but less so on roads, especially in uh, rural locations. After the initial cost of a drone, it's relatively uh, inexpensive to go out there and carry out a survey. And flying is, uh, being able to fly is quite straightforward. Uh, so what are some of the rules? Um, it's the Civil Aviation Authority who sets out the rules and they are uh, risk-based rules. 
So the lower the risk that the drone poses, the less restrictions there are. So this image uh, of these two drones are the two ones that we use um, on our inspections. The smaller one on the right is a Mavic Mini and the body of that is about the size of my hand. Uh, so this weighs 249 grams, which puts it in a A1 category, which is the lowest risk. Uh, this means you can fly it over people. Uh, and importantly for us, you can fly it close to or over roads. The larger uh, drone is a Phantom 4 Pro, which weighs, weighs about two kilograms. Uh, this is a higher risk, um, which you can't fly within 50 meters of uninvolved people. Um, so that includes a road as well. Um, the smaller one that cost about 400 pounds secondhand, whereas the large one was about 2000 pounds secondhand. Um, to fly the large one, you need to pass the um, A2 certificate competency, which is a six, six hour online uh, test, or six hour online course uh, with an online exam and some practical flying. So this is an example of what um, the photogrammetry can produce. So this is an example site uh, near Stroud. Um, once we get these uh, 3D models together from photogrammetry data, we can look at distances, heights, areas, and volumes. I'm sure you can pick out a few of the uh, geomorphological features as well. Um, but one of the uh, key benefits of this is we can export this as a digital elevation model. Um, so that's essentially a 2D map with elevation data. Before we fly the drone, we'll put out uh, targets uh, which we can use a GPS staff to get control points. Um, so once we export uh, this data set with the uh, control points, this can be um, tied in with British National Grid coordinates. So this can go into a QGIS program. Um, I'll talk through an example, um, which is a piled retaining wall along uh, the A46 uh, near Cooper's Hill. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Cooper's Hill, which is in the background, uh, the top there. That's the famous cheese rolling hill near Gloucester. The A46 uh, is located uh, mid-slope and it's situated on landslide deposits. So we have a typical um, uh, Cotswold geology at the site. So you start off with uh, the limestone at the top of the hill, then onto the landslide deposits, then the impermeable mudstone layer at the base. Uh, so this is a pile retaining wall. Uh, this was a photogrammetry survey, which we did in November. So a bit of background on the pile retaining wall. This was constructed in 2011. Um, previously, there was an old retaining wall, which uh, was damaged due to ground movements. Um, so subsequently, this was, uh, replaced, uh, this was constructed to uh, support the road. Uh, however, whilst the road is staying still, the ground in front of it is continuing to move. We have um, two inclinometers in the road and two inclinometers immediately at the base of the wall. Uh, the inclinometers in the road show no movement, but the ones at the base of the wall are showing movement. We weren't too sure about what processes were happening in the field below, so we decided to use drones at this site to uh, give more understanding. Uh, you might be able to see these white squares. Uh, they're the targets that we used uh, to get the coordinates and positions so we can tie this into British National Grid. So um, this is, we only have one data set for the site uh, from the drones, which comes out as a digital uh, surface model. But what I've done is compared this with some uh, freely available government LIDAR data and to produce this uh, heat map of movement. Um, so, if you'd like to ask about geology, I've got a slide for that at the end, but just conscious of timings. Um, what I'd like to draw your attention to is um, this thin line of higher red values here and this area of red down here. So the more red it is, the more subsidence that's been going on. And this ties in with what we've seen on site. So uh, closest to the wall and at this southwestern side, we've noticed the most subsidence. Um, it's just over a meter in about 10 years of subsidence which has been going on here. So although um, this, although we only have one base set data which we're going to build on, 
um, comparing it with some LIDAR data, it kind of gives us uh, an idea of what we, what we think is going on. Uh, so some of the lessons learned. Um, the larger drone has a better camera and can get better, uh, better results. We're currently monitoring a uh, landslide in Wiltshire, um, which I can't talk about, but um, we've been able to pick up ground movements about five centimeters and above. Um, using a drone with a better camera gives better results. Um, to improve accuracy of a survey, it's good to find positions around the site which you know aren't moving. That means you can go back to these positions and um, check the results each time. Results should be used as an extension to um, observations. So we need to use our engineering judgment to figure out what's happening on site before going out or once we have the data to decide what's going on. Uh, but it's also useful for areas with access issues. Uh, for example, we've had a couple of places where landowners won't let us onto their land. It's perfectly reasonable to fly the drone alongside and get pictures. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Once again, Robert, who's got the microphone, Jenny. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay, uh, Robert, should I say? So um, I'm not an engineering geology, and I was intrigued when you mentioned that um, you had there were a couple of uh, inclinometers in in the road. Yeah. And I can imagine what these do, but could you explain what what an in inclinometer looks like and how it works, please? Sure. Sure. So um, an inclinometer is this uh, this uh, a rod which we put down a borehole. And in the borehole already is a deformable tube. So this rod, which we put down, measures the deformation of the tube. And then from that, we can get the direction of movement, um, what elevation of movement is happening. Uh, so it helps us uh, yeah, find out the slip surface of a landslide and also the rate of movement between uh, repeat visits. That's me. Hi, Rob. <clears throat> Sorry, I was interested in your, in your heat map when you're looking at sort of differential movement. Um, I'm interested in why you use the surface model and not the terrain model in generating the heat map. Uh, so the output we get is a surface model. So the photos, uh, they pick up vegetation quite, uh, they just do as part of what comes through the picture. You can get LIDAR mounted to drones, which will obviously go down to the, uh, that level of the ground. But um, it, for areas where um, we have a sur surface model, um, there wasn't much vegetation, so just used the DTM from the government LIDAR data. Um, I wasn't too sure what time of the year the government data set was taken from, whereas our data set was taken from November time when there's not many leaves on the trees. So, yeah, that's how I went for it. Okay, and Karen. Uh, thanks, Robert. Your images were really great. Thank you. Um, apart from getting access to the site, I wonder if you could outline some of the other limitations that might hinder you in doing a good drone survey. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, the main one is weather. Uh, can't fly over certain wind speeds or um, in rain. Uh, another one is establishing control. Uh, so as I said, we take this GPS staff with us to get control points. And it's best to put the control points around the outside of the area you want to uh, survey. So if you can't access those areas, that limits to where you can look. And also it can take quite a while for the GPS staff to lock onto satellites. So I've been on sites where we've done five positions in a couple of hours and other sites where um, it's taken a, an hour or two just to get one position. So um, that's the limitations from the cost side. Um, also the smaller drone that we've been using, we're still not too sure what sort of accuracy we can get with that one um which we'll find out in future but we know of a bigger one but we we definitely know we can get about five centimeters accuracy Good. thank you thank you right we're now going to move on to our final speaker of the sequence so this is uh, roberta McAllister representing the southeast regional group uh roberta can you hear and see us Yes, can you see and hear me? We can, uh, although we can't see your slides just yet. Okay. 
That's fine. I'll just share my screen now. Hopefully that's worked. Yep, all good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, hi, my name's Roberta. I'm an engineering geologist from Atkins, and today I'm here to talk to you about using a three-dimensional geological ground model in the design stages of a large construction project. So I've actually been ill this week, so please bear with my fragile voice and possible coughing during the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start off with a question to you. So how do you manage and interpret the data from over a thousand exploratory holes collected over the course of 60 years and covering a site of over five by five kilometers? So it sounds like it might be quite complicated, but hopefully I'll be answering this question over the course of the next 10 minutes. So my presentation is going to cover introductions to the project and the site, including the ground investigation history and the site geology. I'll briefly discuss how we developed our model and what we're actually using the model for on the project. And then I'll be talking a bit more generally about the pros and cons of 3D geological modeling. And I'll be inviting some questions at the end. So unfortunately, I can't go into details on the project that I've been working on, but I can tell you that it's a major energy project located on the east coast of the UK. So Atkins is the designer for the enabling works. So designing the temporary works areas and preparing the main site area ready for construction. So Atkins has completed the basic design and currently progressing through into detailed design. And though I'm unfortunately no longer on the project, as you can probably guess, my involvement in the project was predominantly in the ground investigations and in the geological modeling. So the site we're looking at is pretty big. So the borehole sticks on the screen here cover about four and a half by four kilometers, but this is actually only the onshore portion of the site and without the various sort of associated development areas, they're a bit further away. So we have well over a thousand exploratory holes, which have been completed in over 15 ground investigation campaigns on and around the site, as shown in the model extract on the screen here. But what's on the screen doesn't include the recent works or the offshore works. And so these GIs cover both the enabling works and the main site works. And there have been multiple phases as the design progresses. And we've had also the results of investigations for previous works kind of in the vicinity of the site as well. Within this, we've got varying hole types, depths, purposes um, across different areas of the site, depending on things like end use and the monitoring requirements. So the geology of the site isn't technically complex in the sense that there aren't any faults, folding or intrusions, but the geology gets slightly complicated as the large area, the sort of variable topography and the site history itself means thicknesses and strata are quite variable. So as shown in this model on the screen here, the bedrock is the, the crag deposits, which are shown in pink in just a second, which are predominantly sand. Um, these overlie the clays of the Thames group. Beneath these, we've got the Lambeth group, Montrose group and the chalk, but for our purposes, they're kind of not, not really relevant. They're deeper than what we're interested in for our structures. And then inland on topographical highs where we get above five to 10 meters, we have glacial deposits comprising mostly sand, but also clay over the crag deposits. Uh, we've got the crag surface from about zero to five meters elevation. Topographic lows, we've got a paleo channel which actually cuts down into the crag and that widens out towards the coast into the sea. And that's actually infilled with peat and alluvial material. And in some cases, uh, in some places, sorry, this alluvial material is at the surface, but in other places, we've got a significant amount of made ground from construction of the site next door, which has actually compressed the alluvium. And then towards the beach area, we've got beach deposits, predominantly gravel above the alluvium. And we've got pockets of made ground across the site, generally got topsoil at surface and farmland actually covers much of the, the inland area. So onto the model itself. So we created our initial model, as you can see on the left hand side of the screen here, using CAD, which is, I would say, a more basic software during basic design. And we updated the model using Leapfrog Works, which is a more advanced and specialist modeling software in advance of the detailed design. So on screen, we've got screenshots of 
geological boundary elevation contours. So you can see actually the differences you get when using the different software. So I would say the one on the right is probably slightly more realistic. Um, I think geological processes would cause a sort of more smoother transition. So they're not usually going to be the sort of sharp angular boundaries you can see on the left. So our model was bounded by the site boundary, the topographic survey, and by borehole depth coverage. And it went through various stages of validation. And I understand that the model is still progressing. So it currently includes just lithologies, but next steps could involve collaboration with hydrogeologists to include groundwater contours. We could subdivide the strata. We could incorporate things like in situ testing or seismic data into our model. <coughs> So what are we actually doing with the ground model? Why is it useful to the project? So as far as I understand, the project's got many different uses for it. So first of all, in the earthwork strategy, um, we're doing things like earthworks balances and volume calculations. So you get an idea of how much material is gonna be removed from the ground and that then informs stockpile planning. You can get an idea of the cost and the facilities needed for actually importing new material. And you can plan uh, whether or not you need to improve the weaker alluvium or alluvial material as well. So you can also cut sections through the model to inform the geology around specific design elements, such as a cutoff wall, a sea defense, tunneling infrastructure. And you can also use it to plan various site tests and trials. So things like putting ground anchors in, uh, mixing trials for ground improvement. And we've used the model um, sort of throughout the project team. So including people like ground engineers, drainage engineers, civil engineers, and we can share the outputs of the model with the wider project team. So including people like contractors. So I think that would be my main benefit of 3D geological modeling. So the varied uses by the project, but I think they're useful for most project sizes. So anything upwards of a handful of boreholes particularly good for larger sites with lots of holes in them or particularly complex projects. So I think, I mean, from a <coughs> from engineer, from an engineering geology perspective, I think if you've got more than a couple of boreholes, then if you're looking at a collection of logs or a spreadsheet taken from your raw data, looking back at your whole location plans and then trying to interpret, um, I sometimes find it quite difficult to actually make the connections between things. So as soon as you get that 3D interactive image in front of you, interpreting boundaries, making the connections between the geology you're encountering and things like historical and current site plans, aerial photographs, topographic maps, it just all becomes so much easier. Um, spatial representation is really important as well. So specific to my project from our 3D model, you can quickly cut sections through the model and fill them with color, topography and you can import like various design elements so it easily showed us the spatial differences in the alluvial material that's actually expected around each design element so which material is dominant in which locations differences we can expect in depths and thicknesses stuff like that and uh, having a 3d interactive image I think in front of you can help to explain to others, so non-geologists, what's actually going on in the area. You could get efficiencies in cutting your cross sections. So because they're so quick in your 3D model, you can spend more time checking the interpretation, reviewing, assembling the right notes. So effectively it's risk mitigation there. They can help with managing your large data sets and your modeling software generally complements your BIM model, which is getting more and more important. But there are obvious drawbacks, um, as you can see on the screen here. Um, cost is a big one, even for your more basic modeling software. And if you're using that advanced modeling software, it definitely requires training before you just jump straight in with producing a deliverable. And I know that from experience. I think quality control can be a bit of an issue, particularly if the software is kind of thinking for itself, it's doing its own calculations and interpretations. And also getting the right people with both your software knowledge and your geolo geological knowledge um, to review the model, that's particularly important. So upfront planning is incredibly important in 3D geological modeling. So we've had a quick look at the, the 
project that I've been working on, uh, the site and its uh, ground investigation history, how we developed the 3D geological ground model and what the project's been using it for. And also I've discussed um, just quite quickly the benefits and drawbacks of 3D geological modeling. But I asked you at the beginning, how do you manage and interpret all of this data? So hopefully I've answered that question for you, a 3D geological model. So as cheesy as it sounds, I hope that everyone can get a chance to do some 3D modeling because uh, as stressful as it is when the software won't do what you want it to do, it's pretty awesome when it actually works. And as you can see in my presentation, it's nice when you've got a, a model to twirl around on the screen and cut sections through. So thank you everyone for listening and I'll take any questions after having a cough. Thank you very much, Roberta. Um, Karen, can we head to you first this time? Absolutely. Well, um, thank you, Roberta, and well done for getting through that with the cough. Um, thank you. Yes, it's an impressive amount of work you had to deal with there. Um, I wonder if you could tell me, with the software you've used, do you find it quite fit for purpose, or are you able to manipulate it and add subroutines to make it make it so? Um, so I think it is pretty so the ones that we we use were pretty good they were kind of up to the task um i think there's a lot more learning that i could do to probably make take advantage of it more possibly than we did um i think there are some things that i was kind of picking up as i was doing it that i was like Ugh, maybe it would be better if we could do this or do this um because i think sometimes it's kind of a either you're doing all the work or the software is doing all the work and it's quite difficult to sort of merge that together a bit um so i think possibly some of the software could could use some sort of improvements but um i think that that is kind of always happening like this particular software that we we use we're always getting updates come through so i haven't actually used the latest version of it yet so yeah hopefully Great. thank you thank you Hi, Roberta, it's Dave here. Um, hello. Just, hello there. Uh, interesting um, models there. When you're obviously establishing the, 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 the sort of geological model, you've started with obviously well-known bedrock stratigraphy. How did you then start to differentiate the, the quaternary stratigraphy? What approach did you take to, to have the units that you put into your 3D? <laughs> um, so it was quite difficult in some places because some of the material does actually look quite similar. Um, so you've got the crag deposits, which are actually quite varied um, across the site because it is so big um, and because the, the strata are kind of dipping and we've got the, the different topographies that you are getting different units within the crag deposits. And then you might have, say, alluvial sand on top of that or glacial sand on top of that. So it can be quite difficult. So sometimes we're looking at the kind of in situ test results so things like SPTs when you are going down in your borehole and you suddenly kind of jump up in your your SPT you can kind of think well maybe, maybe that's a boundary um there's other things as well like the what's interesting is the the made ground so if you can still see the screen um the made ground is in in gray um which kind of covers the whole of this particular part of the site but it's actually reused material from the site next door when they were kind of going through construction so again that can be quite difficult to differentiate so sometimes you'll get lumps of concrete and stuff in mixed in with that reworked material but otherwise they can look quite similar so again it's kind of the the properties of the ground sometimes more than necessarily what it what it actually looks like so it is quite difficult i think having a 3d model really helps though because you can actually see what's going on um, so if you think, or oh, I'm not quite sure about this, you can see how it fits in with everything else around it in the model and go, oh, actually, no, we were right to keep it as this, or, or maybe we should change it to, to something else. Hello, Roberta. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. So, so you discuss the benefits and the drawbacks of 3D geological modeling. Mm -hmm. With your particular model that you've been building, I wanted to ask, 
which aspects did you find most exciting, either in terms of, you know, perhaps learning a new technique or, or um, perhaps something that you actually discovered, ah, oh, that so that that is on top of that or underneath that or faulted against that. So, so what aspects were you most excited with, res to, uh, with respect to building? I think um, it's probably the fact that kind of I, I'd been working on the project for quite a while before kind of this model had been created. So I had a kind of an idea in my head of what the geology sort of looked like across the site. But sometimes it's quite difficult to actually get that across to other people. And you might have new people joining your team, for example, and you're trying to explain to them, like, this is what's going on here. We've got this, this channel going on here and we've got this on top of this. And then over here, that kind of thins out a bit. Um, so it can be quite difficult as well because I joined the project in the summer of 2020. So that's like the middle of the pandemic. So at that point, I'd never been to site before and we were getting other people joining our team who'd, who'd never been to site before. So it's quite a nice thing to have a visual kind of idea of actually this is the topography that's going on here and this is how it relates to the geology in this area and that kind of thing so yeah I hope that's answered that question yeah that, that's great so com communicating that the what yeah I think so yes okay thank you thank you right well thank you very much uh, Roberta much appreciated thank you so, ladies and gents, I think that brings us to the end of our sequence uh, of presentations this afternoon. So uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to say one big thank you to all of our presenters for their time, their efforts and their, their talks this afternoon, or I think uh, in Francis's case, quite late at night over in Hong Kong. Um, it, I think this is what the essence of this whole competition is about. It's to see such a broad uh, variety and breadth of different subject matters being discussed. So uh, a big round of applause for all of our presenters, please. <laughs> I know it sounds cliche, but I don't envy the judges um, who are now going to go retire to uh, one of the side rooms. They're going to have a bit of a deliberation uh, to discuss uh, their chosen winner. After about 10, 15 minutes, uh, they'll come back and they will make uh, their presentation as well. Um, during this interlude, I think Dan, uh, who's uh, my fellow committee member from the Early Career Network, is going to present our annual general meeting just to, to fill the time. And uh, last thing from Karen, uh, you should have received a Zoom link, which you'll be able to hopefully call in on uh, for the deliberation with uh, Jenny and yep. Dave. Thank you. Well, without further ado, I'll pass over to Dan and uh, the judges, we can head off to the other room. Through, there we go. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Early Career Network AGM for 2022. Thank you for coming. Um, so, just a quick review of what we did last year. Um, the main focus of our sort of events and um, the things we put together was a a network, sort of a a schedule of talks about careers in geoscience. So, ranging from geothermal and energy to building materials and how that relates to geology. Um, so we had monthly lecture series um, throughout about six month period. We had a fairly good turnout throughout the year. Um, and we think we really helped a lot of either graduates or people considering geology as a, as a degree or career um, to choose their career paths. Um, so some announcements for the year. Um, Deborah Thomas, who has been our treasurer uh, since starting in the early career network, uh, has decided to retire from her role um, due to work commitments. Uh, so Deborah was founding member of the early career network in 2018 and has been active in pretty much every single one of our events throughout that time. Um, so we want to say thank you for her contributions throughout. Um, by way of a vote carried out in a recent committee meeting, um, Alex, who will be talking later, uh, has a, just has agreed to become our um, treasurer. He was uh, previously holding the role of secretary throughout the year. Um, he joined with myself in 2020 
uh, and he works as an exploration geologist in the mining industry. Um, as Alex is retiring or has moved on to become treasurer, I, I've volunteered to take forward the role of secretary um, for the, until the end of our term uh, next year. Um, I was holding the role of specialist group liaison, which is basically a communication role between specialist groups and regional groups in the UK. Um, so that role will be open to um, anyone who wants to step forward for it. Uh, another announcement, Matt Webster, also on our committee, uh, he's decided to also resign from the committee this year at the end of his term. He also joined as a founding committee member in 2018. Um, again, thank you, thank you for your help, Matt, throughout the time you've been here. Um, yeah, good luck to you. So I'm going to open up um, the call for nominations now. Uh, so we have currently two positions open. Um, so to, if anyone would like to join the committee, um, there is a three-year term available to you. Uh, equally, if you don't want to do that entire three-year term, it's something we can look for down the line. Um, so you can apply via our Gmail account, joelstockecn at gmail.com. Uh, and if you'd just like to write a few lines about your introduction, who you are, and why you'd like to join our committee. Um, no more than an A4 page, ideally. Um, and we set a deadline for the 15th of July, 2022. Um, so I'm going to pass on now to Alex, our new treasurer, uh, just to talk about our plans for the year. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, so as Dan outlined, um, you know, last year we held a, um, a series of a quite popular uh, election series, um, and obviously during the pandemic or post-pandemic as it was at that point, uh, you know, these were minimal, well, no cost. Um, as we now move back to kind of normality, uh, we would like to increase the amount of hybrid or in-person events that we do. Therefore, obviously, the cost of um, putting on these things will increase. Um, and as I'm sure uh, you're all aware as well, rising cost, generally speaking, means that the cost of this is going to rise even further than we would have expected. Um, so currently, what we've done, um, we have set a provisional budget, which is actually the budget that we had uh, for 2020, which, uh, when we thought 2020 was going to be normal. Um, so we, look, we are looking to do another lecture series, um, uh, roughly six, six presentations or six events at this point. Now, this was, this was agreed by the committee earlier this year and has been some change to this. So I will, will be revising um, the budget uh, that we will have for this year and also the, the kind of lecture series and also the other events that we're going to have will change. But this is the budget we're going to, going to have at this moment in time. And over the next couple of weeks, as a, I will review that and that will be agreed by the committee and that will be uh, submitted to the Geological Society uh, for their approval also. And that's pretty much out with that. I would like to say, um, yeah, it's uh, nice to see some people here. Um, I hope we will do more of these in the future. And uh, what we'll do now, we'll wait for the judges to deliberate and we'll then uh, give the this year, which is a Brazilian agate um, uh, prize to the winner. And also uh, we'll also be gifting the judges um, some uh, continuing the South American theme, uh, a bottle of Chilean or volcanic wine. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.
Oh, good to go. Okay. So this is a bit like the uh, Johnny Depp deliberation, isn't it? You're all sort of waiting on, on sort of tenter hooks, you know, the sort of global global context. But, um, but oh, yes. Oh, AV suite. Is it possible to make sure we've got all the panellists on show, um, including our judge, Karen, when she comes back online? I don't know if that's possible. Maybe I'm talking into the void. <laughs> yes, that's what you do with these teams, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Or drift off and look out the window without realizing you've got an audience. Yes. That we all. Oh, yeah, there we are. Brilliant. Okay, well, the um, uh, three judges would like to um, thank everybody for their um, uh, fantastic presentations. I think we, we thoroughly enjoyed all of them. It's nice to see such uh, enthusiasm and uh, early career engagement in what are really some quite um, astoundingly technically challenging projects. And uh, it's also, I think, good for the whole of the applied geosciences and geosciences to see such early engagement from graduation that you're actually sort of working on these such diversity of projects and fantastically complexity of geological ground models. I think that, that's great to see in terms of that exposure. Um, we had um, a very um, um, uh, interesting deliberation, but we had a unanimous uh, verdict. We were all very clear about um, who we thought could produce the, um, the best presentation, showed a clear enthusiasm for the project, some very, very interesting slides, and obviously had sort of uh, got you know the technical knowledge you know that went with the project so um, our unanimous verdict was that uh, this year's winner will be Hannah from the uh, uh, South Wales group so Hannah wow thank you <laughs> thanks I'm just gonna go on a train now to bring your trophy to you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay. right so Hannah uh, just in case you can't see it. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll make sure we can uh, maybe try and get that sent up to you at some point. But uh, once again, thank you to all of our seven finalists. It's been a fantastic afternoon. I hope you all agree. Um, one last round of applause, please. And just before we finish for the drinks in the library, uh, we'd also like to thank our, our three fantastic judges as well. Um, so a round of applause. And we've also got some bottles of wine, which we'd like to, to give over. If you'd like to come up and... <laughs> oh, is... Uh... <laughs> Karen will make sure not to drink yours we'll send it down to you as well thank you <laughs> I think that brings us to a close thank you once again everyone and if you'd like to join us in the library for drinks we'd love to have you there cheers have a good afternoon thank you bye, -bye.